We, uh, okay, everyone's cool? Okay. Perfect. Yo, how's it going? How's everyone doing? Are you good? Oh, fuck, nobody cares about you. Um, did you guys, have you enjoyed Freaknik so far? So, yeah, before I start, can we get a round of applause for, was it Will Pig, not Larry? Uh, I don't know. Where, where's the pro? Ah, here. Ah, yes. Hold on. Let's get a round of applause for uh, Ben, Dolomite, Jester Fox, Mirage, Will Pig, Oddball, and Corydon. Yay! All right. Thank them beforehand, because they'll slap me afterwards, so. Cool. Cool. All right. Um, I, I, I guess I'll start getting it all. I'll try to keep this talk under an hour. So I've given uh, variations of this talk a few times before. Has anybody seen this before, by the way? Got a few hands. Oh, OK. You, uh, you saw another talk. I, I've also given this talk. Uh, the first uh, variant I gave was actually a year ago at Freaknik last year. Um, and god, that lasted an hour and a half until they finally cut me off. So I, I, I worked really hard. The next time I gave it, I cut out half of the slide deck, and it lasted about an hour. You mean a gong? Yeah. So, and just as a forewarning, um, it, it's very difficult to cover all the material in this. There's, I, I estimated last I gave this is about an hour of philosophy and an hour of tech. And there's probably more than that, and it, it increases as more people keep doing stupid things online. Like the. <laughs> right. And um, one plug I want to give uh, very quickly. There is in another talk, so, so I, I'm talking about this kind of in a contemporary sense. So there is another talk and another topic about this, which is a history of names. And there was a guy at a 28C3 in Berlin who gave a fantastic talk on that. And if you're interested, I recommend going and checking out his research. He's brilliant. This is much more on the nature of names and how we use names to describe ourselves, identity, and things like that. Uh, does anybody recognize the uh, picture in this, by the way? No Magritte fans, huh? It's a Rene Magritte. Same guy that did Cessine uh, Puzzle Peep, the, the pipe thing. The reason that I chose this, the, the actual name for it is, I believe, uh, it shall not be reproduced. As you can see, it's a guy kind of looking into a mirror, and the mirror reflection is actually at the back of his head again. Because, well, one of the reasons is that the mirror reflection, how much does that actually represent who we are and our reflections as our personas, as our names, identities showing up online and whatnot. The, the question I'm trying to get at is, how does that reflect who we are, and how much control do we get over that? So I don't know. I thought it was a cool artistic touch. So uh, anybody here uh, heard of Google or Google Plus? <laughs> Never? OK, cool. So the, let, let, let's rewind back maybe a year and a half ago, I guess it was now. And was it July 2011? And Google Plus comes out. It's the Google's version of a social network insight. It's great. And uh, a lot of us have major issues with Facebook for any number of reasons, privacy concerns, things like that. And we're like, sweet, Google finally has an answer. And it's actually more architecturally better designed. Facebook was designed as kind of a data insight that Mark Zuckerberg threw together, and it turned into the, what it is now. Whereas Google Design Plus, they put a fair amount of good engineering work into it. There are a lot of cool things that I liked. So, I was at a family reunion and uh, discussing all this stuff, trying to get people. And they had the, the circles. They addressed privacy issues. Um, the, for example, the, the gender privacy controls was a really great thing. What that was, if you have a gender displayed on a Google+, a lot of people were saying, well, I want my gender to be displayed to some people but not others. I want to have the control over doing that. And Google heard people's complaints, and they implemented gender privacy controls. Now, when Google did this, we're all like, oh, this is great. They're listening to us. They're taking our feedback, and they're putting it back into their system. And um, uh, yeah, I, I thought that was really cool. And then this happened. I got suspended from Google+. Plus. I don't know if anybody else. Has anybody here also been suspended, by the way? Was any? You have a friend who was? OK. And there's a, there's a few people. And I was new to this at, at the time that this happened. It turns out I was suspended under a regulation called the Real Names Policy. So as you can see here, it says, after reviewing your profile, we have determined that the name you provided violates our community standards. Uh, by, by the way, community standards, that was a dead link. Like that, that shows you how well they had everything together. But th this also got me thinking a lot about you know, what is identity? How does it all work? And you know, I don't know. I'm, I'd like to think I'm kind of smart, art, but I'm not a genius. So what does anybody rational do? I Googled it. So 
There's a, there's a number of interesting definitions that the, this identity thing, searching for identity, comes up with. Uh, number one there, the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. Number two, the characteristics determine in this. Now, it, it, in, in the next few, this, this one is more complicated, serving to establish who the older owner, wearer, bearer in their name. and it, it doesn't quite resonate. It says an identity card there. And a, a close similarity or affinity, and the rest of them are mathematical functions. And all of these have one thing in common to me they don't really mean anything at all, and they don't describe what identity is. And I'm like, okay, so I've got something that stumps Google. So let's, let's go ask some really smart, famous people about this and see what they all say. So up at the top, you've got Oscar Wilde. says, most people are other people. Their thoughts are uh, someone else's opinions. Their lives a mimicry. Their passion's a quotation. You've Chuck Palahniuk, uh, author of Fight Club and others. Nothing of me is original. I'm the combined effort of everyone I've ever known. And then you have Shakespeare. We know what we are, but not what we may be. And then Gandhi at the end there, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. So once again, ask super smart people, and none of them seem to have a clue either. So I decided to start thinking about it for myself. Um, on the left there, you see Adam naming the animals from Genesis, and the idea there being that he gets a bit of control over them and is able to categorize them, because when you name something, you have a degree of power and control over it. On the right there is the royal seal, which it is an identity token. It's, a, it's just a way that you can authenticate, you can prove that you have the approval of the king, things like that. And a very important thing I want to point out here, identity and the names are very, very different. Uh, I'll get into identity in a second, but I define it, and this is my own personal definition, a name is a label that is used to identify a person, thing, or concept within a given context. So let's take a look at some context. We have things like con-goers, like everyone at Freaknik. That, that would be an example of a, a group, right, or a context. You have a particular location, like I live in Oakland, Long Beach. I gave a talk there at one point. Specific time. It, the interesting theory, as you get more granular, so for example, we say morning, but I don't say what time in the morning. It could be 9 a.m., it could be 10. I say 9 p.m., I don't say what time zone, and I say last week, but I don't say what day last week, or is it the entirety of last week? And it shows that context is actually really hard to define uh, definitively, but you kind of, kind of get a granularity to it. So, for example, you have interest, which leads into interest tags. The Joe who likes football is different from the Joe who likes baseball. And suddenly you've got two people named Joe, but you've been able to separate them out based on the context. So, Another really important facet of all of this is identity internal or external. So anybody here studied Freud at all? OK, I got a couple people. What's that? Oh, OK. Um, and I, I get into Jung a bit, too, in the next few slides. But Freud had this idea of the id, ego, and superego. The id is the carnal beast within us. The ego is the intellect that triumphs over the beast. And the superego is the relations that people have with each other, things like that. And there's a lot of questions. As, where, 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 how do we get things done? Does the carnal beast nature of the id strike up above the ego and like debase rationality and like let us go out and do things? Or does the intellect triumph over everything and allow us to have some order? So th th there's some discussion to be had there. Um, reputation is another fascinating thing. You know, what do other people think of you, right? How many people care what everyone thinks of them? Got a few people. Everyone else is shy, I guess. Orla. Yep. Um, okay, and also, how many people here have seen the movie Citizen Kane? Got, oh, about half the audience. You don't remember? Okay. So, Citizen Kane is fascinating. I love using this example. Oh, what? what? Uh, uh, the comment was uh, the challenge to the question, what do other people think about you, is you want to keep your job. Yeah, and, and there are reasons that people curb what they say to appeal to the whims of others. And sometimes it's uh, uh, rational, sometimes it's, it's uh, sometimes there are other factors involved. In any case, the movie Citizen Kane, in the beginning of the movie, this guy named Charles Foster Kane dies, and he utters the word rosebud, and that, that scene itself is very famous. But the whole movie is where they're interviewing all these different people to get an idea of who, like all these people who knew him, to get an idea of who he was. And it's getting everyone else's perception of who he was, and that's kind of getting the integral of his persona and his personality to find out, well, what was it that made him? And uh, the, the, the final thing I want to talk about on this slide is just my, I don't know, anybody here an Oscar Wilde fan? I love his work. The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. So let me, come on. Ah, so. 
One of the, uh, a person who was doing a lot of work with Freud, who did the e ego and superego, was Carl Jung. Anybody read any of his stuff at all? Got a few people? Great, fantastic. And, and this gets to the kind of the core of how I believe identity might be, if you're able to put words to it. So Jung at least, or, or I, I, I guess together, we, we split identity in two different types of identity. That's the rational identity, or the conscious, as he calls it, and the emotional identity, or the unconscious. And rational identity is math, logic, reason, is set theory, words, it, like some of the math properties that we saw when we did the Google definition. And the emotional identity is much more emotion, you have group dynamics, feeling, instincts, and thoughts. Things which are difficult to share, so it, it, what we often call common sense. What we often might just assume that everyone knows, things that go, oh, things that go unspoken. Kind of the, as Jung alludes to this thing called the collective unconscious, which is the relation that everyone has with each other, which is um, how you know just the mood that everyone has, things like that. So this becomes really, really important just because you have to take into account the fact that words are very tricky. One of the notions that this gets into is a word is a symbol, right? A name is also a symbol. We'll get into this in a bit, but it represents meaning, and that meaning, I, I, I contest that that meaning falls into the nature of the, subcon or the unconscious, because you can't know what somebody else's meaning for a word is, or what they think of when they hear it. You can get an idea of it. But it, it's this interesting hierarchical dynamic, where you have that which is defined and that which is undefined, and that which is defined as things that you can share with each other, and that's how we communicate, and that's why we have different definitions, different meanings for words, you know, misunderstandings, and things like that. So, that is kind of the foundation of some of this stuff. So the conclusions that I, I, I wanted to get at with this is that the meaning of identity is very complex, and identity by its nature is multifaceted. And since identity is context dependent, nobody has any single identity. And there's a, a, a lot of movement right now within the tech community and other places to try to reduce everyone to having a single identity. And I can test that it's actually uh, not only invalid, but actually kind of a hurtful thing to do. So, Let's get into some different kinds of names. Uh, we, we checked out names earlier. So we got birth certificate, you know, given name. You have the, the wallet name. Scud was one of the people involved in the Nim Wars stuff. When I got suspended, a bunch of people also got suspended at the same time, and we fought back against Google. It turned into what was called the Nim NYM Wars. Uh, hashtag Nim Wars if you want to look it up on Twitter. You have things like government issued IDs, and it could be a driver's license, a passport, social, things like that, student ID. And all these other things. There's one thing I want to point out about all these different types of names and IDs that is really fascinating, is they can all be completely valid, and they can all be different at the same time, which says something about the nature of names. So a common example I've used is uh, you might have a driver's license and a passport that have the same name on it, and then you get married and you change your driver's license name. They both describe you, but one has a different last name on it, assuming that you have a last name. So that's just something to keep in mind. And, and it's also important to note there are different types of names, not just the ones we discussed. And I, I kind of break this into definitions a bit. So there's a pseudonym, a name that might not be found in any of the documents that we mentioned. Might's an interesting word. And the, the nature of pseudonym where you could have a pseudonym that actually is the same thing as your legal name. And it might not be linked to uh, any of those documents. Then you have a polynym, which is a name consisting of multiple words. So for example, Charles Foster Kane is a polynym. And a mononym is just a, a name consisting of a single word. So Charles would be a mononym. And then an autonym I describe as a name which is bestowed upon oneself. And I think it's important to uh, differentiate that from pseudonym. A pseudonym, literally the etymology of it means a fake name. An autonym is not necessarily a fake name. And, and you also have the phrase nickname, which nickname, the etymology, is actually an additional name. And if you think about the, the difference between the words fake and additional, that, that, that has some, some important meaning to it. And then there's also anonym at the bottom here, a name representing anonymity. And it, one, one, one of the questions I try to explore is I don't actually know that any, I don't know that on anonymity is possible because there's all kinds of different ways you can sort of a traffic and figure out who somebody is. I also want to draw this distinction here between anonym, which is anonymity, and pseudonym, which is pseudonymity, where a lot of people don't seem to understand this. I've been seeing with Zuckerberg and the, you know, the Facebook crowd, the Google, people saying, oh, we, we can't have anonymity. It's like, well, these people aren't actually being anonymous. They're using a pseudonym, and it's a very different thing. Anonymous is much more like the anonymous coward comment from Slashdot. It's a, if you made a comment on Slashdot and you didn't like log in or enter a name, it would just brand you as an anonymous coward. So 
I, I really do not like the concept of a real name. You'll notice it's not really used anywhere in this talk. There's a few reasons for it. Um, there's some really negative implications because if you have a real name, then all the other names that you use are, well, what's the opposite of real, anyone? Fake. Fake, false, yeah, there we go. There's also kind of a lack of agency to all of this. If you have a real name, and let's say that you change your name or something else unless you go through a certain system, well, people might always come up and say, well, what about your birth name is this? Your given name is this? And if you think about it, this real name, it's, you don't have any control over that, do you? Almost never, right. So if you have no control over it, that means it has a power over you. And that's it's something we'll get into in a second here. Um, also, why use the re word real name when there's so many great alternatives? I give a name, that works fine. Birth name, that works fine. Legal name, that also works fine. You know, uh, something that's on a driver's license, that's issued by law, that's a legal name, great. And I think it's also interesting to explore where the concept of a real name comes from. Where in society do we, we decide that the name that is granted by the government and a driver's license or something like that is real and all your other names are not? It's, do, do, is that a reflection of the power of government or where else? It, it, it's interesting to think about that. But I want to put that out there because a lot, so, so Google has what they call the real names policy. I'm like, well, it's not really a real names thing, is it? It's more of a common names policy because, yes? If you make up a name that's completely nonsense, can it be an irrational name? Oh, God, real numbers and... Right. Don't, uh, the other comment, don't conflate, conflate linguistics with mathematics, you'll hurt yourself. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. I uh, promised I wouldn't run over time. Okay, so uh, another phrase for these are nom de plumes, which literally translates into feather name, which is, I think it's kind of beautiful. Uh, Publius, anybody familiar with Publius? Somebody in the, oh, of course you are. Yeah. Publius was the name that was, uh, all these Federalist Papers, when the Constitution was originally drafted and they were trying to ratify it, it was John Jay, James Madison, and Alexander Hamilton, I believe. They all wrote these uh, letters that appeared in newspapers, and they were all signed by the name Publius. So, what, pardon? Oh, yeah, it was all pub public. Yeah. Oh, pu okay, Publius is where we get the word public from, sure. Um, okay, I'm, I'll speed it up a little bit. Okay, Emperor Norton I. Anybody know of him? Sweet. Okay, three, four. Yes, and of course, there's a picture of His Majesty, the man who, um, this was in the mid-1800s, late-1800s in San Francisco. He lost a lot of money in a bad bet, and he kind of went nuts. He declared himself the Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, sent a letter to the ESF Chronicle, and they published it, and everyone went along with it. And he began walking around wearing Emperor regalia. He issued his own currency. People, stores took it. Um, yeah, this guy was pretty crazy, but he's awesome. He's actually uh, also one of the uh, living saints of the Church of Discordia. So I want to plug it, although that's technically a title and not necessarily the same thing, but uh, somebody who is, uh, I believe, honorable. Then Nicholas Perbaki. Anybody know him? Because there's no such person as Nicholas Perbaki. It was a group of French mathematicians in, I think, the 1920s or 30s, I think it was the 20s, who decided to try to write mathematics from the, rewrite mathematics from the ground up. And all of their works they published under the name Nicolas Bourbaki. It's fascinating. There's a, some secret society elements to it and some other things, but I just found that fascinating. There's other reasons people would use it. Richard Bachman, anyone know? Stephen King, yes. He, uh, among other reasons, he wrote it. On, he, he started writing books under a different name to see if it would still be popular. Uh, Voltaire, who uh, published Candide under that name, so because the King of France wanted to kill whoever had written it. You have the Bronte sisters, who published under male names because they couldn't get published as females. And there's all sorts of different reasons that people might need them. So here's some examples of why names matter. Period. Why should we uh, be thinking about this? Um, I'm going to assume everyone here has heard of WikiLeaks. Is anybody not? Oh, that guy, okay. Well, you'll be escorted out of here by security. <laughs> so, one of the tenets that Julian Assange has tried to espouse with WikiLeaks is that the source does not matter, the content of the document matters. And you can actually verify a document not just by who submitted it, but I also, if there are other documents which corrob uh, corroborate with it, or uh, you know things like that, like phrases. For example, if you have a bunch of uh, memos that were from a certain context or certain space, if they all have kind of the same lingo in it, like say something about a Jeep, 
you, you can begin to use that to sort of uh, figure out, okay, that, that, that's pretty reliable and legitimate. Um, porn WikiLeaks, has anyone heard of them? Porn WikiLeaks, so there's uh, the AIM database, the adult, in, what is it, the adult industry uh, medical database is a centralized database where all uh, adult film stars like pornographers are required to submit uh, regular test scores to, you know, HIV tests, things like that. Well, some asshole uh, hacked into it and did a WikiLeaks on it um, and, and published a website called pornwikileaks.com. And one of the few FBI takedowns I'm actually okay with because that was despicable. Um, and it had things like it had people's legal names that had their driver's license and in some case more information than that in it. And if you can imagine that there's some people who really don't like what porn uh, actors and actresses do and having access to where they really live or in some cases where their parents live, things like that, dead cat shows up in the doorstep. That kind of stuff happens. So perhaps there are reasons why names are important and separation of identity is critical. Um, the AOL and Netflix databases, uh, each of the companies respectively released uh, data sets that they tried to randomize and like engineers were able to go through and do kind of data mining analysis on it and they were able to figure out based on the searches and the times of searches and things like that, who had actually been doing these searches and when. So they actually de-anonymized the data and actually began to map some of the search results to people who had done them. Yes. Okay. So the AOL was worse because it left in social security numbers and other things. Sure. Absolutely. Okay, so here's some more reasons. Uh, deep through it. Anybody familiar with Watergate or the Nixon stuff? Right. You know the one crazy thing about Woodward and Bernstein? They never revealed a source. Period. Through the whole thing. Uh, so so uh, Deep Throat, who was later revealed, I, I believe to be Mark Felt. And the, the, there's this whole dynamic as, as to uh, reporters reserving uh, the, the right to secrecy about their sources and things like that. Because there are some people, if they, like a whistleblower, for example, if you release information, that could cause serious harm to you if people find out who it is. Uh, Valerie Plame, anyone remember her? CIA operative who was uh, outed and uh, wound up with the whole thing in the Bush administration. What's that? Oh, she wasn't? Okay, I misspoke. What was she? Oh, she was just an employee. Okay. And um, witness protection program, another uh, example. Somebody needs to go into hiding for some reason. Government will move them to another town, give them new names, IDs, things like that. I guess uh, maybe names are important after all, aren't they? So an extension. So a, a name is kind of a singular thing, but there's also these things that are social networks. And when most people hear social network, they probably think Facebook and Google and Twitter and all that. Well, I call those online social networks. Whereas I, 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 always, I would say all of these things count. Like um, one example I've used is courtrooms. Uh, with a courtroom, you have this group of people who they all show up and you have different roles that people play uh, by their titles, by what they wear, by the positions that they have. It represents their skill set. So you have a judge that has a certain uh, level of skills and you know, experience and history and things like that. And based on where they are, based on the role that they play, you know how to interact with them and address them. Just like the jury, just like the, the, the plaintiffs and everything else. And these are all just regular people. If you take them outside of the court setting, they're just going to be a regular guy that you could go out, or a regular woman, I suppose, who you could go out and you know, watch a movie with. They're normal people. It is just when you put them into this context, they assume this newfound identity, this persona of them that comes out. Um, skip to the next one. So I define here a social network is a force that brings people or their personas together on a regular basis. And that word persona is very important. Persona, um, I take the Carl Jung version of it, and how to explain it. Basically, it, it, it's the image that you cast, the face that you put on, right? And um, notice that personas can also be something which is digital. It doesn't have to necessarily be in meat space. So a social network could be something where all these different people are hanging out together. I would consider anonymous a social network. I would consider 4chan because all these people are interacting in different ways. So. The, so yeah, yeah, yeah. so a, a friend is someone who you would choose to be in contact with. And the, the dynamic of friendship online gets a little tricky. What if you feel that you're a friend with somebody but they don't even know who you are? Um, things like that. And also social networks and context are useful because they help to solve namespace collisions. So um, a couple more definitions. I'm almost done with the, the foundational groundwork of it all. Uh, anyone know the difference between interpersonal and intrapersonal? Really, really important. Interpersonal is the communication between you and somebody else, between each other. Intra is your own internal personal dialogue, often called conscious or you know, whatever else. 
Dunbar's number is a fascinating study that was done in 1992 by Dr. Robin Dunbar. Basically looked at groups of primates that were wandering around in the social groups and the sizes and found a direct correlation between the, the size of a primate social group and the size of their brain. And doing the math, they actually uh, established, I think for Homo sapiens sapiens, aka us, the size or what is commonly called Dunbar's number is usually around 150. Depending on the context, it, it varies between 120 and 150, but that really means that's the most people that uh, an average person can kind of keep track of and have, to have within their friend group. Um, Dr. Cameron Marlowe did a follow-up study in 2009 on Facebook using a different Facebook social networks and, and, and found something very similar. Found that everyone on average has about 120 friends. And the, further, you also have, I think, six or seven friends that you tend to correspond with and communicate with on a regular basis. And it, it varies. Uh, women, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but women are a bit more social and more communicative than men are for some reason. So I think it's like six, between five and eight. I think five is how many uh, for the men and eight for the women, something like that. Um, but really, really, really fascinating stuff because just how it applies. So, does anybody familiar with um, uh, Joseph Campbell and Hero's Journey? Okay, sweet, sweet, a couple people. And my follow-up question to that is, uh, is anyone here familiar with Star Wars? Okay. What? You never know. It could be a newbie here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Star Wars? Go ask your mom. <laughs> So the reason I bring this up is because George Lucas credits the hero's journey and Joseph Campbell's research to his inspiration for creating the Star Wars stuff. So the hero's journey is basically, actually, first let me start off defining the right-hand path and the left-hand path, and I'll get the hacker handle question in a second. The right-hand path is the structure that you come up with. It could be your culture, your community, the language you speak, the place where you live, things like that. The, the, the structure, the stability, the ground and the baseline and that you have as a person, that, that which represents your, uh, who you are on your entity. Left-hand path is more, well, do I want to keep going the way that I've been told? Do I want to follow tradition or do I want to go off and find my own way? And here, uh, and here is journey kind of embodies the notion of the left-hand path where you become this explorer aspiring to be a hero as you adventure on. So you have things like the call to adventure, which could be follow the white rabbit, right? And uh, from the Matrix, of course. And often you'll get the, the supernatural aid, which it could be a lightsaber, Luke Skywalker. Then you get to uh, the threshold, you, you'll meet a mentor or a helper. It could be, uh, what's, what's her name, the, the lady that Neo goes to see? The Oracle, I think. Right. And, and you can see, and there's all these challenges that come through. And I mean, everyone goes on things like this, right? The challenges are very important. Some people overcome them, others don't. And eventually, uh, th there's the abyss and there's the death and all this. This is how life works, right? We make mistakes, and some of them we recover from. Some redirect where we go in life. And, and uh, I, I, I would like to say that the revelation and the transformation is where, say, Neo discovers that he is the one. And he discovers that he has all these powers and abilities, which is in my opinion, less him doing what he's supposed to do and more realizing that he can't simply be this, uh, this person and have this power. And then you have atonement where you take all those lessons you've learned, you become at one with yourself, you bring it all back together, and then you're back at the, uh, where, you, where you begin. You return back to everyone, you can reintegrate into society, right? You're just the same person, right? I haven't learned anything. Uh, so I think hacker handles are very important in this element because they allow if you apply a, a, a name to somebody, it, it's kind of an invisible privilege in a sense, if you, if you think about it. So the, the example, that I, anyone here use IRC? Chat rooms, things like that. You ever, do you remember going into IRC for the first time and there's all these strange names and all these strange people? Okay, see somebody in back, you know, you're dipping your toe in the water to, to, to feel it out. And then you're hanging out in there for a while and you begin to slowly develop these friendships, you form these relationships. Or you kick ban somebody and you turn into an asshole and you get like K-lined or something. So you, you know, you fall out of the challenge. You know, you put your whole foot in the water and you keep on going and eventually you have a, a new family, right? And th that's just how the hero's journey works. Any social context, if you go to raves or, uh, th th that's my experience. Or if you go to, I don't know, swing dancing parties for a long time, you'll begin to meet all the people that have been there for a while. And maybe they know you by whatever name you give them. Because it's, it's the meaning that they ascribe to the name that really matters. So I feel that Hacker Handles, which is, by the way, in most cases, a name that you bestow upon yourself, and you get this newfound agency, and you're able to do this exploration, and things which aren't connected back to your previous uh, persona, your previous personality. And 
that, that, that can be really, really eye open and allow people to explore and grow. Because I think education is really important. I think the best way to explore is to try out new things and not have that fear that things are going to come back and you know hit one of your identities and that keeping that separation is important to me. Uh, the other thing that I want to point out here is, see this line here at the top and the bottom? Consider that when we saw Jung in the conscious and unconscious, symbol on the meaning of the word. So as you go through, the symbol acquires that new meaning. Um, quick question, how many people here have ever worn uh, a necktie or formal wear? All right. Does anybody treat you differently than when you wear a t-shirt? Great. Somebody in the back? Yep, yep, yep. Um, I, I, and that's what I would call a visible privilege, in a sense, to be treated a certain way based on uh, something that you exude, whether it's you know, visual or maybe you have a certain kind of accent so people treat you differently. Um, I have found that if I introduce myself by my legal name, I will be treated very differently than introducing myself by a different name. And that's really something to think about. So I'm going to depart. I could spend an entire hour just talking about this. But I want to bring this back into the Google stuff. So this, th this is um, kind of my own depiction of what Google and Facebook and these other places have been doing, right? So I call this Google's method after, I suppose, Newton's method or something, where you have this hierarchy, right? Important to emphasize that. So you have the real name, which is a driver's license in this case, which is more legitimate. By the way, does anybody know the etymology of legitimate, like where it comes from? It comes from the Latin legitimare, which is to make legal or to make more lawful, which is fascinating because if you think about that and the use of the word legitimate in that case, what it's doing is saying you're within the law. Law, which is something that others bestow upon you, and therefore this hierarchy is actually, well, if you use the real name and the driver's license, somebody else has power over you, don't they? And if something is less legitimate, it's somehow less valid, less worthy. I think it's important to disambiguate valid from legitimate in that case. And you have all these pseudonyms, which we already discussed is a fake name. That's what the etymology is. So there's your pseudonym on Twitter. There's your pseudonym on Facebook. There's your pseudonym on you know, 2600 or whatever else. And kind of the, the bullet point here, labels give someone else power over you. And that's one of the critical elements of all of this. So let's flip to my method. I spent a long time trying to figure out how would I draw out the way that I think it works. And this is a draft I'm, I'm still kind of figuring out because, I mean, has anybody here else here solved identity yet? So, what's that? Yeah. So, I think using labels as an aid is much better than using them as a tool of power. So, at the top here I say, labels help define relationships. So, remember from uh, Jung, we have the, the, the yin-yang, which, by the way, you have the conscious and unconscious, the rational and emotional. The yin-yang, it's black and white. You spin it around, it turns gray, which is how the world really is. What? Come on, I had to do it. Anyways, so I have, ah, oh, there's Twitter, there's Facebook, there's driver's license, all these little social groups and things like that. Oh, wait a second. Okay, so this is a relationship. Notice how it's separated from that, because it, it's my relationship with Twitter that I believe has that name of, uh, in this case, Johnny X. And my relationship with Facebook is where, because I have this relationship, that is the name that I choose to give. So another interesting element of this is, uh, see the driver's license, uh, John Smith, let's say that's your legal name. You have the friends and family who call you Jack. And I, 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 I uh, infer that this relationship, Jack, is actually derived from, as you can see, A, B, C, D. So Jack would actually be derived from John Smith which actually fits the definition of a nickname, which is an additional name. The, one, the other reason that I like to call these relationships as opposed to something which is codified, a relationship can take many forms. It could be synchronous, it could be asynchronous. A relationship could be, a, it could be a pseudonym, it could be a nickname. But all of the, the, the most important uh, element of that is you get a choice over how your relationship is. And I think that's critical to understand and to embrace if we're going to, yes, Given you go through the effort, yes. That, uh, that gets tricky. Given that I have friends who don't have social security numbers, that gets tricky. It's not a requirement, actually. It just, it, it, it's, it's a power, it's a control thing, because if you want to do, there's a lot of stuff that you limit yourself from if you don't go through with the system, but it's still a choice that you have. So, 
Okay, let, let me keep going because I'm slowly running out of time here. I have way too much. But that's, we should chat about that afterwards or if I have time for questions because that's a really important point. So, so now that we're moving back on online stuff, just a few things about establishing an identity online, right? How, how do you make yourself known? Uh, blogs, GeoCities, WordPress, whatever. Uh, posts and comments, karma points, which gets, which gets into the reputation idea. Uh, you post stupid photos, um, as, as I have here, cats that look like Hitler, because everyone wants a Hitler. <laughs> Isn't it cute? Look, it's, it's a little, it's a little, it's the fur, right? Wow, this is like, uh, yeah. Sorry, I love kitties. And waxing a little technical for a moment, when you, when you take names away, there's still ways to identify people. Um, I won't cover all of this, but you have headers, you have access times, uh, URLs of people have access, have frequency, things like that. Uh, just to quickly touch on websites, how can they confirm that you are you? How do you prevent DDoS attacks, things like that? There's CAPTCHAs. Um, there, there's all kinds of different ways that you can do it. None of them fully work, whatever work means. But I, I just want to put out there that the, this does wax technical. There is a technical element to it. And forcing somebody to use a type of name or not using a name at all and using an anonym or whatever it is that you choose, you can still often figure out what somebody is going based on kind of triangulating them. So as we get into that, there's, I just want to tout some privacy promoting tech. Uh, we covered a little bit of this in the crypto party talk earlier, but just Tor, the onion router, which uh, the bullet point, it lets you surf the net anonymously. It's, it's useful for insurgents in Syria and places like that. Selective login, you can turn login off if you run a web server, and that actually helps with court cases because plausible deniability, things like that. Um, privacy and sharing settings on website, which, by the way, has anybody here uh, had Facebook change their privacy settings on them without their consent? Many times, yeah. That's another control thing, isn't it? Uh, Remailers, I put this in because Len Sassaman was a good friend of mine. He was the maintainer of Mixmaster, uh, which is a remailer, and he passed away last year. Uh, remailer is a server that you send an email, and it goes through the remailer, and it wipes the headers, and it sends it on. So you have an email that you can send, and it will get to, this, it will get to the destination, but there will be no record that it came from you. So it, it's, an, it's another privacy thing. So some challenges that we run into online. Um, we have sock puppets, anyone familiar? OK, sock puppet are just, uh, if let, let's say that I'm running for uh, admin of Wikipedia, right? And I want to get a whole bunch of upvotes. So a bunch of my friends register accounts, and all of them just go, and they don't even make any edits. They just go and upvote me. Or if I have a post on Reddit that I want to like, get to the top, I just get a whole bunch of people to come in and register an account and like, upvote it for me. Sock puppets is what they call those. Then you have anonymous cowards, people who post something um, without having any name attached to it, trying to hide their traces. That does happen. Um, another challenge is cyber stalking. And I, my guess is that women have more problem with this, uh, with, with just somebody just trying to track you down and being a predator. But uh, th there, are, there are laws for that. Uh, then DDoS attacks, which all of these form into the different, some of the different challenges. And there have been. Uh, some identity-related things that have been popping up in the last few months. A lot more as thing, the world gets more technical. And one of the questions I want to, or one of the things I want to point out is that it's not because they're using that identity, it's because they're a douchebag, right? So another, and the reason that I chose names and relationships, one of the elements of a relationship is trust, and trust builds on a relationship. And trust is also a dicey word, right? You can have financial trust like the Federal Reserve, like, why is your money worth anything? It's because people trust that it has value, right? So, uh, security trust, which is like, you know, GPG keys if you have your keys signed. Emotional trust, do you trust that somebody's going to be there for you when you need them? You have sources, like newspapers. I can trust, oh, wait, this came from Fox News. Uh, I don't know if I can trust that, as opposed from CNN or New York Times or Huffington Post. Then you have things like degrees. How do I know this person is worthwhile, and how do I know they're qualified? Oh, they have a degree from that university. Well, they must be great, right? And you get the experts who create the standards. And I mean, it, it kind of rabbit holes at some point. But in general, trust is a, a very nebulous thing. And it's, but it's something that means something to everyone. And that gets into why reputation is important. It goes back into what other people think about you. What is your reputation? So there's ways you can establish this online. With Wikipedia, one of the questions comes up is, how do you know the information on Wikipedia is uh, reliable? You have things like Wikitrust, uh, which Basically, it, it's a plugin that can tell, it, it can take your Wikipedia story and it can color the words based on how reliable the words are. They have an algorithm that does that. You have, uh, so, somebody make a comment? Oh, okay, I heard. You have things like Reddit where uh, you, 
I'm, I'm not going to get into the Reddit Gawker fiasco here, but the other thing about Reddit, though, a lot of people have been doing AMAs on it, um, which is an ask me anything. Reddit has, the other interesting thing about Reddit, actually, I've seen a lot of stuff like this lately where there's a video or a, a post or a story that shows up on Reddit and the next day it's on CNN. It's a, a lot of these uh, boing boing CNN, Huffington Post, a lot of these uh, what are becoming major mainstream online news sites are actually sourcing things like Reddit to find out what's actually going on, what's newsworthy. And maybe it's because the news place's filter process broke, I don't know, but I, I just noticed that happening. There's Google and Facebook. We already have a pretty good idea what they're doing and I don't really like it myself. You have issues with SSL, which I won't get in too much right now, although there was the DigiNotar thing where um, the question is how do you know that your SSL certificate on your website is actually valid and what happens when a company that issues certificates gets hacked and people start issuing bad certificates. So that's trust again, right? Um, anyone heard of clout? Okay, only a few people. Good. Yeah. So clout is the service where you can put, I think, your Twitter or Facebook screen name into and it will give you a score, I think it's a, one, a 0 to 100 scale, telling you how reputable you are or how much influence you have, like that, right? The one problem, nobody knows how they come up with that number. And it seems to me, what's that? Right, if you don't know how they come up with the number, there's the trust issue again, absolutely agreed. And it's like, yeah, no, that's been getting a lot of shit for that. Yeah. Right. Okay, so I, I just wanted to put that out there. Fuck, I have to keep moving. I'm only halfway through these slides. So, and it gets more dice. What's that? So, I'm, I'm trying. I'm doing my best. All right, anybody familiar with uh, Zuko's Triangle? So Zuko's Triangle is uh, the criteria which a name must fit, like a digital online identity must uh, fit. And Zuko, uh, Zuko Wilcox, is also involved in uh, Tahoe LFS and a few other things. Uh, he's done a lot of cool projects, right? Um, this contends that in order for a, uh, how to put it, um, an online digital name can only match two of these three criteria, right? So you have, it can be global, where it extends everywhere, it can be memorable, or it can be secure, securely unique. Because it's something could be super secure, like it's a GPG key or something like that, but nobody's going to remember that. Um, and th there's actually one other element in here that was later added in. It's uh, time, because the other thing about a name is you might only use it for a certain amount of time after which it expires or uh, ownership of that name gets transferred on. But th this has been coming up a lot in uh, cryptography discussions just because um, the, the, the question is not only how do we make a secure system, but how do we make a secure system that regular people can use. If you, if you give somebody a GPG public key, who the fuck is going to know what to do with that unless somebody who already knows what GPG is? If you give somebody a business card that says, you know, Bob Jones, everyone's going to know what that is. So this, this is one of the challenges. There is a system called Pet Names that creates a key value pair of name and then key, which actually goes towards solving this issue. But that, that, that is uh, just, just a concept to be aware of. So before I get, go into this slide, I just have a quick question for everyone here. Um, hands up, how many people here uh, have a Facebook account? Okay, keep your hands up. How many of you uh, have your job posted on Facebook? Okay, hands up. How many of you have your salary posted? Right, so just think about that for a moment. Cause, uh, then you should be arrested. <laughs> By the Facebook police, right? So, I mean... What the hell does transparency mean? Is transparency something we have control over? Or is transparency something that somebody forces us to be open? Um, and I, is there such, what, what does full transparency even mean, right? Am I going to upload videos of me having sex all the time or something like that? Um, yeah, exactly. Well, there's a video of me with Richard Nixon's mask on if you want to check it out online. Uh, yeah, Google for, or DuckDuckDo, I mean, for Richard Nixon blowjob. So, more important, okay, Richard Nixon aside, he's been, th he resigned, okay. Um, who decides how transparent we get to be? And I think that's a really, really important question we should all be asking. Well, we do? The right. Right. If you use Facebook, do you get to decide how transparent you are, or does Facebook fuck your privacy settings up and make things open? Or do they coerce you?
Right. Right, if you're part of a corporation or something else, where it can have cost to you if like multiple identities get linked back together. You should be transparent with the people whose lives depend on you. I, 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 uh, transparency is hard. I'll just say that much. Absolutely. Uh, what, what was it you just said? I just want to repeat it for the mic. If you don't want people to know about it, don't put it on Facebook. Although that, right, right. Mm-hmm. There you go. The fun of having a persona on Facebook is to see all the interesting new emails you get from a fake persona. Well, so uh, difference really quick between active and passive communication, and this is actually something I consider fairly important. I define active as something that you put out there. So for example, um, I put something on the news, or I send out an email blast, and it goes out to all these people, and they get that information. Passive communication, it is available, but you have to ask for it. An example, this is the Freedom of Information Act request, or the FOIA requests, where you send a request for data to the government, and they'll give it to you, I don't know, two years, or however long it takes for them. But the information is available. That data is there. It's just you have to go through some effort to get to it. So just, just, just the dynamic there. So a couple of quotes. This, this goes back to the, the NIM wars that we had. Eric Schmidt, the executive chairman at Google, uh, in his conclusion about all this stuff, the only way to manage this, by this he means online identity stuff, is true transparency and no anonymity. In a world of asynchronous threats, it is too dangerous for there not to be some way to identify you. We need a verified name service for people. Governments will demand it. <laughs> yeah, somebody. Everyone gets their own IP. All right, and the, the, by the way, the other thing I want to get at, uh, where it says governments uh, will demand it in the name service, there's actually something like that in the works called NISTIC or National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyber, National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace. It's a project going on with NIST, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, and I've actually, I think I've now become involved in it, forming uh, what we're calling a NIM group to ensure that the government is forced to take. Um, multiple identities and online anonymity and things like that into account as they create standards for what, what seems to be like online transactions and things like that. I, uh, I can get into that with anybody uh, after this. Uh, second quote there, if you have something that you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. What do you guys think about that? Wow. Yeah, well that's the guy who uh, is uh, up in charge of Google stuff. So. Uh, I, I don't want to see pictures of his bathroom. Yeah, unless he has a rubber ducky, they're fun. Uh, okay, sh questions. Uh, okay, um, how am I on time, by the way? Uh, Ten minutes. Okay, so uh, I'll take one of the questions. Uh, you had your hand. Okay. Okay. I, there was a question back there, or another comment. Oh right, right, right. Well, that gets into like getting taboo topics into the end of the news. That could, that's good. which is actually important. I know a lot of people who uh, work in porn or sex workers, and they're in school to be teachers and you know, things like that. And they're brilliant and they're fantastic people. But there's this fucking social taboo against it. And if somebody were to link together, oh, you did porn, you can't teach here anymore. And there's multiple reported cases of that happening. Yes. Right. Right. So, so the, the comment is basically it's difficult for society to deal with somebody who has more than one identity. And, and more than one persona. And sure. I, think that comes, I think that comes down to a little bit about trust because we have a difficult time, unless we feel like we know everything or a large part about you, we have a difficult time accepting trust. And if there is this facet of your life that we don't know. 
Sure. Uh, the, well, the, I, I want to hear you say, um, I, I'm running out of time, but sure. Uh, what were you going to say? Well, and that gets into some of the power issues too, sure. Okay, I, I should move on to the next slide, which is our friend Mark Zuckerberg. Everyone I'm sure is familiar with him. So the days of you having a different image for your work, friends, or coworkers, and for the other people you know are probably coming into an end pretty quickly. Having two identities for yourself is an example of a lack of integrity. So that's Mark Zuckerberg telling us what integrity means. Bullshit. All right. So Chris Poole, aka Moot, the founder of 4chan, and this is beautiful. The portrait of on identity online is often painted in black and white, especially by Google and Facebook. Who you are online is who you are offline. Human identity doesn't work like that online or offline. It's not who you share with, it's who you share as. And kind of uh, one of the theses of my talk here, identity is prismatic. So. Think about that, a prism, you shine the white light through it and you get the spectrum of the rainbow. I, I, I think that's a bit more descriptive of it all. So quickly jumping back into the tech for a moment, I, I, I just want to get some definitions out to give us some better context here. You have uh, Facebook, Twitter, and all these things. By synchronous and Facebook, I mean you send somebody your friend request and they have to accept it in order for you to have a friend. Um, where, whereas with Twitter, you can just follow somebody unless they have their account blocked or uh, un unless they have their account, but it is an opt-in thing. It is not a default thing. And there's also tent.io, by the way. Uh, diaspora is no longer tent.io. Tent.io is a fork off of that. It's basically a decentralized social network, which means that all the data is not on a single server. It's scattered in servers, and it's open source, so you can even install, install it yourself. Um, so a lot of these are asynchronous. Google Plus, you can just add somebody into your circle, um, unless it's changed. I haven't used it in a year and a half. so which puts me at a slight disadvantage. And I just want to put this in here, too, uh, in terms of some civil liberties stuff that we get into. This is a project the EFF did. This is actually data from last year. But who has your back.eff.org? They went through a whole bunch of court cases and came up with a, a four-star system of things like tell users about data, data demands and fight for user privacy in court and things like that. And I, I, I want to point out that Google is actually quite good at some of this stuff. It's just a, a few other things they don't quite get. So uh, another thing to point out, here is that Facebook also has the real names policy, or a, um, yeah, it's registration and account security. It's, it's, it's just like a subsection. But they have one. They just enforce it very differently, although they're starting to change that. We'll get into that in a second. And it, it's also not really defined, and it's kind of a case-by-case -case thing. So this is the original Google real names policy. So to help fight spam and prevent fake profiles, use the name your friends, family, or coworkers usually call you. That sounds like fine. OK, I can deal with that, right? So I, I don't have time to go into all the details. And I've actually, um, I had a correspondence as I appealed my Google Plus account, and I posted all the emails online. Um, happy to give you links afterwards if you want. But just a quick summary, it was suspended. There was confusion over the meaning of common name. And after a little bit of back and forth, they requested my government-issued ID, at which point I'm like, why do you need that to verify that aesthetics is my common name? That doesn't make any sense. And when I fought back with that, and I started asking them about like, data protection and policy, you know, how when will they delete the data? What's in uh, procedures? Uh, they just reinstated my account. And uh, two weeks later, bang, I got suspended again. So that, that tells you a little bit about what's going on in Google. I do want to point out, if you recall from the beginning, the first suspension notice, this one is more developed and much bigger. Um, so, and, and there were a number of other people, including my friend Sai. He's a really great guy. S-A-I, that is his full legal name, as you can see from his driver's license. Permission to use that, thankfully. Because, uh, uh, yeah, and, and asking for ID is strange, because I consider a driver's license or any other ID sensitive information. So, and then there's Doc Popular, a friend of mine who does, uh, he's a musician, and he does uh, puzzles and games and things. Really great guy. And this is also, um, he, when his account got suspended on Google+, Plus, he actually changed his name, and you can see the tagline there. Made up a fake name because Google wouldn't let me on with my real one. And it says Doug Poop on there. <laughs> OK, so where are we now? 
It's been a year and a half, right? And how many people heard that Google said that they uh, changed their policies to allow pseudonyms, as they call them? Anyone? Okay, there's a f okay, some. So here's some of the changes. I actually checked this last week to make sure that I was up to date. So updates to the policy as of October 27th. They limit the name changes that you make. You can actually change your name. You can only do it three times every two years. I don't know where that number comes from or why. Uh, the names appeal. If you appeal your name and say, oh, no, I, I have a good, you, I, I, this is who I am online, right? Well, they say, oh, well, one of the criteria, we will allow you if uh, one of them is send in your driver's license or government ID. The other is if you have a significant following. So what does that mean? So once again, Google has placed themselves as being the arbiter of what you're allowed to say under what name. And I think that's kind of fucked up. And there's this also this other thing that they have. It's called the nicknames policy. I'm like, well, that, that's interesting. I know that they said at the Web 2.0 conference last year they were going to enable like pseudonyms or nicknames or personas. That they actually have a policy, and they, they even have like you can click this button and that button to add one in. I'm like, that, that's odd. I wonder where that comes from. Well, it turns out they had a patent granted uh, in September 18th of this year, so like a month and a half ago. Something I want to point. And this is patent number 8271894. If anybody cares. Um, one thing, and, and the, the, there, there are a few screenshots, but this is kind of where the direction Google seems to be going. Uh, do they have this implemented on Google Plus? Does anyone know? Okay, so this is coming up. So as you can see, uh, no, no, notice the model here. You have somebody's first and last name. For having a first name and a last name is part of the, the community standards policy. You also have personas. And, and notice this hierarchy here. And also notice that within the create personas, you, you can just have a single string that's your name. So they have the hierarchy where you have whatever your legal name is, and I assume they find that out through the government issued ID, and then you have all these different personas. So I remember when I said Google's way at the very beginning, you have the real name and then the, there we go. That's what's in the works for you guys. So Facebook also had their own uh, trick up their sleeve. Oh, am I going to get kicked off in a second? Okay. So th this was going around on Twitter being called Snitchgate. This was, uh, if people don't use Facebook or didn't see this, this was an experiment. Facebook was running this like a month ago, maybe, where you're randomly wandering around through Facebook and you get this little pop-up. And what does it say? Help us make Facebook better. Please help us understand how people are using Facebook. Your response is anonymous and won't at affect your friend's account. Is this your friend's real name? So it started to be called Snitchgate. Um, so yeah, and the, the, there's all these options, but it, it's fascinating to me because when you get people thinking about that, 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 that's, it, that creates a mood, it creates kind of a, a gestalt, a, a, a pattern of thinking where you, yeah, are you a Jew? Is your friend a Jew? Oh, well, it's not a big deal. Just, just, just let us know. We'll take care of it. Don't worry. So uh, by the way, one of the questions here is, well, what happens if we pass a law requiring people to use their legal names online? That will, of course, improve the quality of everything, right? Well, actually, it turns out South Korea did this. Um, in 2002, the Korean elections uh, for South Korea, they were having all these problems with, uh, on forums and things, like people doing all kinds of douchebaggery things under names. So they're like, oh, well, let's pass an in. They called it the Real Name Verification Law. It was passed in 2003. <laughs> The RRN, the, registra uh, the resident registration number, is kind of like a social security number. And they required that number to be used for using any of the sites in South Korea. I think it's under over like 300,000 or 100,000 users or something like that. And you're required to submit that. And uh, th th there's, there's a number of criteria for how it was all handled. But they wanted to use that to improve quality. They define quality as they have a list of about 50 or 60 what they call curse words. And they also have what's called anti-normative activity. So that could be going against the grain of the flow of the community, things like that, offering a dissenting voice. Uh, so they discovered, after years and years of study of this, it was repealed after the KCC, the Korea Communications Commission, found a 0.9% change in quality. They forced everyone to use their legal name online, and they found that much of a change in quality of it by the quality standards. And there's also a follow-up study by Carnegie Mellon, which gets into the details of the number of users and the frequency and things like that. Don't have time right now. But if you're interested, there actually is a real-world case study example of how all this stuff works now. Um, the, it, yes and yes. Uh, it, it's be, how to put it? There were different groups and different uh, case, the, the experiment and case studies on like. 
Oh, oh, okay, that's fair. That's fair. Oh, there, there are many criteria they used. I recommend looking at the paper. It's, it, it, it's really well done. Uh, so, so lessons learned here, though. Uh, Google's policy still sucks. Google is trying to solve a social challenge with a technical solution. Facebook is threatening to join the game. And also, as we saw in South Korea, forcing legal names not only hurts people, it simply doesn't work. So just, uh, I'm sorry, just, just a quick closing remarks. I promised I'm almost done is uh, wikitrust.net uh, is just an idea of uh, how to uh, get trust within Wikipedia, things like that. NISTIC is the, the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace. It's an ongoing project. If you're interested in like discussing this stuff, but maybe you're not technical, come talk to me, because uh, there's stuff going on that you can be involved in and help uh, make things better. There's also, uh, by Mozilla, they did uh, what was called Browser ID, now it's Persona. It, 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 it's effectively, um, I guess a lexicon of different names that you can use to log into things. So for example, you have email addresses registered with it, and then I can go to any website. So just like Facebook Connect, you can use Facebook Connect to log into something. You could use um, Mozilla Persona to log into something, but you could choose which name you use. And because it's used in Persona, it's been vouched for, which inherently also creates a CA type thing, a, like a trust authority. Uh, there's also Tent.io, which is a decentralized social network, and it's open source. And it, I, I checked it the other day, and there were actually commits as recently as a day ago. So um, it's being worked on. So just some closing remarks here. Explore decentralized systems. Every solution fails in some way. Google still doesn't get it. Also, there's no such thing as a real name. Don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. And uh, join and support all these different things. There's a lot of projects going on. A lot of people do have a clue. Uh, the ones that don't tend to get all the noise. But uh, And there you go. Uh, do I have time for questions at all? or? Uh, What's that? No questions? OK. I will be uh, in the floor nine area if anybody has questions for me. And you can also follow me or, uh, I don't know, abuse me on Twitter or something. So thank you. <laughs>